Welcome everybody to the Water Relief Podcast on the Fish on First Podcast Network. Um, here with Brian Hoeing, who is really making me test the rules with with who I have on the podcast because this is supposed to be a reliever podcast. But oh, you really? went and started yesterday, <laughs> so I'm all over the place right now. So you consider me as both? I don't know what I'm, to I'm consider. A hybrid. I'm a yeah, hybrid, hybrid, so I can, hybrid. I can do either. Um, so we'll just we'll start with last night. We'll go with yeah. recency bias. Four innings, three hits, no walks, five strikeouts. Mm-hmm. He didn't get the win. No. To me, that's a federal crime. That, that I think that's a, I think that's an outdated stat. To be honest, um, I think. <clears throat> well, can't you like put a, a little discretion in there if you think a starter doesn't go five innings? You can make it be shortened up to where they go a certain amount and they still get to win. So I'm told that it's up to the scorer's discretion if the game doesn't go nine innings. Gotcha. So Either, because the game went nine innings, yeah. and you only went four innings, yeah. which it was an outstanding four innings. Yeah. Either way, man, we got the win. I'm not too worried about that, but a win's a win in our book. It doesn't matter who it goes to. <laughs> so you've been in multiple situations this season, yep. whether it's in relief or as a starter like last night. How's that been for you and the mindset and the preparation? How's that been juggling that? It's been – it hasn't been that bad, to be honest. Um, I think for me – Coming up, I was a starter the whole time in minor league baseball, so I have that experience as a starter, and um, I'm able to use that in the uh, up here in the big leagues as far as starting and relieving goes. I take a little bit from each, the mindset, the preparation, um, but uh, it, it's gone pretty smoothly. I think Mel's done a good job of helping me mentally prepare for whether that be a starting re- starting role or a relieving role, um, and kind of just kind of going with the flow and, and working on the uh, on the run there. So speaking about Mel, he's considered one of the best pitching coaches in the league. Um, what's something you've learned from him in the short time that you've uh, known him? Yeah, he's been great for me. Um, just the way to the way to attack hitters, how to study hitters, the more in depth analytics of hitters and what they do. Obviously, you got to work on your strengths, pitch your strengths as a pitcher, but it does matter who's in the box and, and knowing what their weaknesses is and what their strengths are helps out a lot. And Mel's done a great job with breaking down video, heat maps, and all of that to um, better help me uh, pitch out there in the, when I'm out there pitching. Um, so you're from Batesville, Indiana. Mm-hmm. It's a location surrounded by baseball. you got the Reds there and, the, and the, of course, Louisville Slugger right, Factory and right. the whole history with Louisville. Yeah. What influence did that have on your development and love for the game growing up? What's that, just being from Batesville? Just being from that area. Yeah, yeah. It's a small town in Batesville, and I grew up playing Little League Baseball there until I was like 12 years old. And like you said, the, the Great American Ballpark where the Reds play is only about a 45-minute, 50-minute drive. So I grew up going to Reds games all the time with my family and friends. Um, huge Reds fans growing up. So I think that's where I kind of got the love for baseball. Um, also, I have some family ties. My cousin used to pitch in the big leagues too, so I think that was another inspiration. His name's Alex Meyer. He pitched for the Angels for a little bit. He retired in 2017, I believe. And like you mentioned, I also went to Louisville, so Louisville Slugger Museum, going there as a kid, and then eventually going to school there. I've had a couple trips there to the, the Slugger Museum. It's great. Even though I'm not a I'm not a hitter, I still enjoy going there and checking out the wooden bats and what they have to offer. It's a really cool experience. Um, so in the span of one season from last year to this year, it looks like you're a completely different pitcher. Yeah. Um, what are you? What what, do you, what changes have you made? Are you gripping pitches differently? Your spins up, velocity is up. W- what have you been changing? If if you're allowed to say that. No, yeah, I am. I am. Um, I will say I, I put in a lot of work this off season. Like I, you know, when during the off season when I was up in Indianapolis, it was cold. You know, on rainy days, it was. I was in the in the field house working. I was putting the work in, and, and it feels good because. You know, it's, the season's gone pretty well for me so far, and it's good to see that that hard work in the offseason has paid off. Uh, I trained out a place up in there where we did work on a couple pitches and some different grips with my slider and my sinker and my changeup. Um, we were starting to get the analytical side of it, pulling up the track man, the data, the spin rate, like you mentioned. And we were just tweaking with the, with the, sh- with the movements of the pitches, and it's really helped me so far. Um, also got stronger, put on some weight. Um, I think that's maybe where the velo came, cleaned up my mechanics. But overall, I think heading into spring training this year, being in my first big league spring training, um, that was able a time for me to able to kind of slow down and um, not let the game speed up on me last year. Um, the game was definitely fast-paced for me, I can't lie. But this year, it's slowed down tremendously, and it's helped me out a lot. How much has the, the new rules, like the pitch clock, 
uh, affected you? Is it helping you? Is it hindering you? Yeah, honestly, for me, not too much. I've always been that fast-paced pitcher who, when I get the ball back, I'm immediately back on the rubber. Sometimes it's honestly in my disadvantage. I work too quick, so I have to remind myself to slow down. But the clock is honestly, for me, it's a uh, reference point where I know if I'm speeding up or if I'm slowing down because I can just look at the clock. And if I'm on the same time every single time, it's like, okay, I have a good pace going here. Or if it's getting late in the clock, it's like, all right, I need to work a little bit quicker. Or if it's early, I can like, I need to slow down a little bit. Um, but overall, I've really enjoyed the clock, especially with it last year in the minor leagues. I was able to get used to it there. And so this year, the second year around, um, it, I've gotten more used to it, and it's been great. So a lot of pitchers have been like, <coughs> trying to mess around with like hitters' timings and the clock. How much have <coughs> you tried to get get hitters off 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 balance with the clock yeah. and like maybe wait an extra second right. or, or quick pitch? I think that's a huge with the, with the pitch clock now. It's it's the game within the game. Um, that started in the spring training when, because these big league guys who have been up here for a while, they've never had to really deal with a pitch clock before. So these veteran guys, um, they're trying to get used to it. We're far enough in the season now where I think most of them are, you know, are used to it. But early in the season, absolutely, even in spring training, you could see it. Um, there were some viral Twitter or viral uh, videos on Twitter where you know pitchers would, the guy would call a timeout and then the pitcher would just wait there, right? And you'd come set and there would still be 13 seconds left in the clock and they would just wait for 13 seconds and the hitter already called time, so he can't call time again. So it's like, as a hitter, I know they don't want to just stand in there and just wait for 13 seconds with that bat in their hand. So it's kind of like that where you can take advantage of it. Um, but I try to do that when I'm out there on the, on the mound. If I, if I find a situation where I come set and there's a decent amount of time left, I will hold just to see what the hitter does. Um, I think it's worked out pretty well. Or also, if I come set, I can throw it pretty quickly too. And with the running game, right? So if you hold, um, that can kind of time you up. So you definitely have to mix up your holds there. But there's definitely way, definitely ways to manipulate the clock and your in the pitcher's advantage. So yesterday you uh, you made a start with Stallings behind the plate. Yeah. You you bounced around with both catchers. Mm -hmm. What? How? How? important is it to have a good relationship with the catchers in, on your team and have a good game plan with them? Oh, it's, I think it's vital. Um, Forty and Stallings do, both do a tremendous job back there. I trust them. I've seen the work that they put in, um, like I talked about earlier, with the heat maps and knowing the hitters and their strengths and weaknesses. Um, so for me, it makes it a little bit less stressful because I know that they're calling a good game back there, so I don't have to worry about so much, okay, what pitch am I going to throw here, where I just need to focus on what I'm doing myself, not what I should throw it. Um, but they do a great job, and like you said, the connection is, is huge because they know what you like. Um, each catcher knows what my tendencies are, is where I like to go in certain counts, certain pitches in certain counts, certain locations. And um, when you're on the same page, it, it makes it a lot more fun out there where you're not just out there shaking the whole time and just kind of like going with the flow and having a good rhythm out there with the catcher. Um, with <clears throat> Nick specifically, did you guys, you guys spent some time in the minor leagues? We did, yeah. You both were, were drafted by this organization. Correct, yeah. You were one of the few guys that was drafted and made it to the big right, leagues right. with the Marlins. So with Nick, he, I think he was drafted in 18, I believe, and I was drafted in 19. And I always heard about Nick Fortes, but I never played with him until last year in AAA. But when I got called up to AAA last year, he was only there for two of my starts, and he got called up to the big leagues. So we really had two, we only had two outings together in the, in the minor leagues. But you know, when I was, I was as I was progressing throughout the minor leagues, I kept hearing about Nick Fortes, Nick Fortes. I was like, I want to throw to this guy. Finally, got the opportunity to last year in Jacksonville, and then last year another time up here in the big leagues, and, and of course this year. Um, no, he's been great. I love him back there. He works hard, tremendous caller, he does everything really well. So. And he's get he's been getting beat up behind the plate. Oh, I know. We were actually lately. we were talking about that the other day in the bullpen. It seems like every single game he's back there, there's at least one or two balls where it hits him in the wrong spot, and he just I can only imagine what his body feels like the next day. He's uh, I, I haven't checked the latest thing, but I think he leads the league among catchers in blocks. Oh, does block he really? Balls above average. I believe it. I mean, he's a wall back there. It's it, it's nice knowing that with the runner at third. Um, you can throw basically whatever, and he's gonna block it for you. Like the other day, and um, we were in Seattle, or Seattle, I believe. There was nobody on base, but I threw a, a terrible changeup that literally went halfway to the plate and, and bounced halfway to the plate, and he blocked it somehow. I'm like, I don't know how in the world you just blocked that, but with no runners I, yeah, I was, on I was base. Saying, with no runners on base, like you could have easily just let that go, but he blocked it, and I was like, I'm just gonna tip my cap to you on that one. <laughs> um, so this new scheduling, you get to the, the teams now face. 
every single team every year. Uh, you just face the Royals. And, uh, no, that question was added a week ago. So you didn't just face the Royals. <laughs> you just faced the Blue Jays. Yeah. Um, and you guys are going to be going out to Boston yeah. soon. Um, I'll be there. So nice. I'm really looking nice. forward there to that you go. Yeah. Have you been um, there? I've been there with a, like a sleep boy camp. Okay. We went with a, we did a tour and we went to a couple of games, but it was gotcha. my first time covering a game. Awesome, I'm, yeah. I'm getting 200 years worth of ballparks this year. I got Wrigley and that yeah. way it's so much fun. It's, I was talking to Barnes about that, you know, back in the day, and I shouldn't say back in the day, but like, you know, eight to 10 years ago, it was, it was a pretty um, historic thing for a player to play at all 30 parks. But now it's like with the, with the schedule change, it's not that hard anymore. And so Barnes, I think his last one he crossed off was in. Oh, I can't remember. We were earlier somewhere. Uh, so earlier I shooting. had him on. I had him on the podcast. Oh, okay. We were talking, about, talking it. about that. It was. It was. Was it Wrigley, Arizona? It was Wrigley, yeah. and it was San Francisco. That's right, San Francisco. Because he yeah. had warmed up and he never. Pitched That's there, right. And he came, crossed them both off. Right, this right. Year. So it just yeah, like because he's been around for a long time, and he's like, yeah, man. He's like, this is my thirtieth park. I was like, wow, that's awesome. And he goes. He goes, nowadays it's not as big of an accomplishment, but back in the day when you didn't play the other side that much, he goes, it was huge. Like if somebody did that, it was a, like a really big accomplishment. Yeah, so. th these days, if you're with the team for full two seasons, you get every you're single part. Park, right? But back to your point, yeah, with Fenway, um, what were you about to ask? Uh, <laughs> how, how, what's your excitement level oh. getting to go and pitch in these ballparks? <clears throat> it's cool because um, I've always been a baseball fan growing up, so I've watched a lot of games on TV. And you always hear about the Wrigley Fields, the Yankee Stadium, Fenway Park, um, and the fact that you're able to go out there and kind of live out that childhood dream and play on the actual the actual field surface um, is very surreal. I never want to take it for granted to be able to go out there and play. And I've heard great things about Fenway Park. I've heard Fenway and Wrigley are like the top two parks where you want to go to and play or experience a game there at least. And the fact that we were able to cross off two of those this year, for me personally, has been awesome. And yeah, the fact that we go there here soon, I'm really excited for it. Um, I played summer ball out there in, in college in the Cape League. And so I have my host family that I stayed with in uh, Massachusetts is gonna come to the game. And uh, that'll be a really cool reunion. I haven't seen them since, I haven't seen them in like five or six years. So that'll be a really cool reunion to have them come out to Fenway and, and see me pitch again. I, I need to write that down and remember to yeah. follow up with you yeah, on that yeah, when we go yeah. to Boston. Yeah. Uh, okay, so now for some rapid fire just to wrap up. Awesome. Um, so funniest teammate. Funniest teammate is... This is not rapid fire, let me think. There's a lot <laughs> Take of as much time as a lot of them. Yeah, there's a lot of them. Um, funniest teammate. I'm going to have to go with Stephen Oker. Why? He's very witty, and he's quick. So if you ever try to give him crap, he's right back at you right away. And like, I've experienced and, and, and it. He's just, and you just freeze. You're just like, all right, you win that. And it's funny. Listen to him give crap to other people, too, and you just sit back and laugh. So, uh, Who's the team hype man? Team hype man. Man. Team hype man. I would go with right now, Archie Bradley. I know he just got here, but he is a huge hype man. Um, he seems like a really fun yeah, guy. Yeah, he's a really good dude. Has great energy. Um, hype man. I would say Barnes too. He does a really Barnes? good. Barnes? Yeah. As far as like, he, he controls the music. He hypes. He hypes it up. Um, that's, that's, so he, that's a later question. Okay. He's always okay. Shoot. Well, he's always about you know like after we sweep a team on the bus, he's like, let's get the music going. Let's play some music. So I he think, doesn't strike me as that kind yeah, of guy. He is that guy. Yeah. Um, your favorite ballpark so far? Wrigley Field. Your least favorite ballpark so far. Your least favorite ballpark. Uh, Oakland A's. I don't know. Because you're out on the field. Yeah, well, what's the field? I don't even know what that stadium is even called. The Coliseum? The Coliseum. The Coliseum. Coliseum. Yeah, that's it's, my, it's not long for this world. Yeah, that's my least favorite. Uh, your favorite song? Favorite song right now would be probably Last Night by Morgan Wallen. Or Living It Up by... Uh, Ooh. Isn't that your walk-up song? No, that's What You Know by T.I. Right. Okay. Living It Up by, oh my gosh, I can't think of who sings that, but Living It Up. Um, who are you giving the ox to? <laughs> Barnes. Who are you not giving the ox to? Oh, wow. I'm about to put Spunny on blast here. <laughs> Go ahead. This is my, this is my oh, favorite part. Oh, man. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Whenever the Spanish music's on, the Latin music is on. I don't know who's controlling it, but I'm just, I just don't know any of the songs, and sometimes it's just like, I need a break from this. So 
I think I think Gene. I think Gene's the one that controls it. So I'm going to go with Gene. Hopefully he doesn't see this, but <laughs> so so far you've visited a few major league cities more than most people in this world. Mm -hmm. um, what which city has had the best food? Best food. Um, I would say San Francisco. The uh, not so I guess not so much the city itself. If we're talking as far as like the in the clubhouse food, San Francisco, the chef there was unbelievable. We, the food that we had there for that three game series. Um, was just tremendous. Every single meal that we had it was unbelievable. As far as city goes, I would say the best food um, probably be Chicago. Um, what's the weirdest thing you've had to autograph? To be or honest, been asked to yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing really crazy. I would just say I would just say bare skin. Bare. Yeah, bare skin. Bare. It's an all encompassing. Yeah, yeah. Just bare skin. It's like well, the worst is. All right. It's like a kid will ask, "Can you sign my arm?" It's like, are, "Is your parents are your parents okay with this?" And they're like, "Yeah." I'm like, "All right, whatever." So you just sign their arm. But I've never had anything like sent to me that's been weird that I haven't signed. At least not yet, at least. Um, and so the last one is, what is one thing people don't know about Brian Howie? <sighs> one people that don't know about me. Gosh, I'm, I'm honestly a super. I'm a simple man. Um, you're a simple man who's in the major league. <laughs> Those two phrases don't go together. Uh, I, see, I usually go with the basketball story, but everybody, I feel like people know that by now. I, 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 I really, don't know it. I played, growing up, basketball was my favorite sport, being in Indiana, and I love basketball. Um, I just happened to choose baseball because I was ultimately better at baseball, but being from Indiana, everybody plays basketball. I would say that's my, that's my thing that people, most people don't know about me is um, I was pretty good, like had some college D1 offers to go play basketball. Where? Um, Indiana, Michigan, Purdue, Butler. Do you ever, do you ever have any regrets about not taking those home? No, no, I can't. I mean, I'm here in the big leagues. I can't. I don't. I mean, it's always like, what if? But I can't complain where I'm at right now. Right. Is there any message you have for the fans? Shout outs you want to give before we wrap up here? I would just say to the fans, um, please come support us. We're having an absolutely great year so far. Eleven games over 500, and we're in late June. This team is a great team. <clears throat> I just want them to know that. We, we expect to win every single game, and we have that, that vibe about us. It's like we're going to go out there and win. And I think even last night's crowd was great for a Monday night. That was awesome. And it was, I the, think high, the, it was, the, it was the, the largest Monday night crowd they've had it? in a couple of years. And, and we feed off that. Like The more fans that come to the games, we love that. It hypes us up. It makes us, you know, play. I want to say play better because we feed off their energy. It gets loud. The atmosphere is very fun. Um, but, yeah, just come on out. You know, it's – it's awesome, an exciting time to be a Miami Marlins fan, a Miami Marlins player, and I think this uh, the season has a bright future. All right, well, Brian, thank you so much. Uh, this thank has been you. the Water League Podcast on the Fish on First Podcast Network. I don't know what order these podcasts are going on. I think I'm recording like three today. Um, thank you, everybody, for listening. We will be back in the near future with another Marlins reliever or starter in this case. <laughs>